Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator for today's WJE webinar, New IBC Office Occupant Load Factor, When and How to Use It. During the next hour, WJE Fire Protection Engineer Warren Bonish will cover the history of the International Building Code's Office Occupant Load Factor, the new changes made to the Office Load Factor and why these changes were made, and where and how to use the new Office Occupant Load Factors. He will also provide example projects showing the impact of the new factor. This presentation is copyrighted by WIS Janney Elsner Associates. And now I will turn it over to Warren to get us started. Warren? Thank you, Liz, and thank you. We will talk today about the new IBC occupant load factor in the 2018 uh, building code, and we'll talk about how this uh, applies to projects and who it's really important to, primarily architects and owners and developers. And we'll be uh, getting into a, a specific type of uh, learning objectives that are really important because we're kind of building a story that um, ultimately will be used to get you guys um, prepared because there's some new responsibilities associated with this uh, requirement that we want to point out. So this is a presentation will get you ready for that. So for, for that reason, we're going to be talking about the history of the building code change on the occupant load factors. We'll go through the reasonings behind it as it relates to the, to the new occupant load factor for offices. And then we'll talk specifically about the specific uses where the concentrated business use occupant load factor is applied. That's a new phrase that came in on 2018. It's called concentrated business use. And then lastly, we'll recognize the impact, we'll give you some examples of the impact of the changes and how it affects new and existing buildings. The presentation will cover, uh, first we'll go through the business use, then we'll cover what an occupant load factor is and where it is in the code, just to get everybody up to speed. Clarification of occupancy versus a function of space. Then the meat of the presentation will be the history of the occupant load factor, where we came from and where we got to in the 2018. All that's really uh, the meat that you ultimately will be needing down the road as we talk about the new occupant load factor and what uh, new responsibilities the designer has. We'll provide some clarification on the net and gross. Uh, we'll address the workplace trends that we've seen from the early 1900s to the current uh, office environment. And then we'll get into the specific code changes in item number seven. And again, this is where the new responsibilities for the designer come into play, which items one through um, six will be needed in order for the responsible designer to address and how to apply it and the impact on new buildings through examples in the project. So let's get started into this. The first topic we want to get covered is basically what a business use is. So when IBC is talking about business use, that's covered in Chapter 3, it's uh, obviously it's uh, an office environment, but it's also related to professional or service type of transactions, storage of records, and accounts. And the simple picking up your dry cleaning or going to the dentist, those are typical business environments as well. But when you actually look at the long list of Group B business, this presentation and, and the code change we're going to be talking about is really only talking about the office environment. And that's, that's what this whole topic is about. So make sure that you recognize that this is a subset of Group B business. All right, so what is an occupant load factor? We go to Section 1004 of the IBC. And the occupant load, start with the occupant load, the number of persons for which the means of egress of a building or a portion thereof is designed. That's straight out of the code for definition. Obviously, or maybe not obviously, the occupant load in turn impacts um, many things in the building. First of all, it impacts the number of exits, exit access, the sizing, the required egress capacity, how big are these stairs, how wide are the stairs. The plumbing fixture counts that you have in the latter part of the building code and in the plumbing code are based upon the means of egress 
calculations. People believe sometimes mistakenly that there are separate calculations for plumbing fixtures. No, it's actually the population from Chapter 10 that determines fixture count later on in the, in the building code. And in Chapter 9, uh, the many provisions of fire alarm, fire sprinklers, and so forth are based upon actually a number of occupants and, and so forth. So again, these definition of occupant load and occupant load factor have a great impact on a large part of the building code use. All right, so how do we determine the occupant load? All right, if we go into this portion of the code 1004.1.2, you can see the number of occupants shall be computed as a rate of one occupant per unit area of the building. Okay, that's the first part of determining occupant load. Then you look at the second part of that paragraph. It talks about shall not be less than the number determined by dividing the floor area under consideration by the occupant load factor. So notice that occupant load factor is not in quotes, which means it's not defined in the building code. It's just a phrase here in the code book. It's not specifically defined, but it is the key element of the presentation and this big code change is the phrase occupant load factor. So where else does it show up in the building code? It actually shows up in the table. You know, it's a small table here, but it's hard to see. But if you look at the very top of the second column, you can see that that is the second place that the occupant load factor shows up in IBC. The first paragraph in the previous slide was the first place, and this is the second place. Now, you're not sure probably where these occupant load factors came from. I'm sure many have different ideas that they just come out of the sky and they plop down here, but that is not necessarily the case. There is some definite um, historical value and um, technical basis um, that these factors that you see on the screen are established from. So we'll go into that. But first, we want to do a little clarification. It's surprisingly, we get a, a lot of calls from architects and owners that uh, get a little confused about the difference between what an occupancy is versus a use or function of the space. All right, the first thing we need to talk about is the occupant is determined by the nature of the use of the building or space and the amount of area for that use. Okay, so that's what you're using to establish an occupant load factor is the use of the space versus the actual occupancy classification of the space. So when we actually look at the table here, you'll see that the first column, the second column, as you know, this is the occupant load factor, it actually says function of space. It does not say occupancy. Okay, so if you look at our two examples, example one, if we have a meeting room, fewer than 50 people in an office building, you know, people mistakenly want to call that meeting room a business office environment. But it's not. It's actually um, the factor that you need to use, the occupant load factor for that room, even though it's in a business environment, is the factor for an assembly use, which is the function of the space. The function of a meeting room is an assembly, and therefore you use the assembly factor, occupant load factor. Second example, a classroom in a university, you can see that we could have a couple different seating arrangements. You could have the traditional classroom style for educational, which is the 1 to 20, or you can have the lecture style arrangement, um, or that could be a fixed number, but it's all based upon the function of the space as opposed to the generic university as a group B business. So key is you got to remember what the function of the space is and establish that as opposed to the generic title of uh, a business or assembly. So let's talk about the history of the occupant load itself. This is really important uh, when it comes to um, understanding the basis for it and what the designer, whether it's a new building or an existing building for a renovation or not, a new construction, the designer who's laying out the space has to understand in order to justify and choose what the right 
occupational factor is. So going back through the code, you've got the Uniform Building Code 1935, that's the Standard Building Code 1950. You also have the um, early edition of the first basically model building code here on the right uh, for the uh, insurance underwriters. Each of these codes are we're trying to address this topic very, very early in the turn of the century. So when we start with the National Board of Fire Underwriters Building Code, this is the first uh, model code established in the United States in 1909. It's a recommended building code. They used floor area to determine the required means of egress. So this is just a copy of the text of that 1909. And you can see the early philosophy that they had was establishing number of exits, in this case stairs, remote stairs. They have even the words remote, which is cool in the sense of a code concept. And then they had a chunk every 5,000 square foot, you need another exit stair. So you can see this philosophy was based upon area of the floor. When you go to the next edition, that previous slide was 1909, you go to the 1915 edition of that standard. You can see they changed the philosophy completely. And this slide has a lot of good technical details. First of all, it talks about um, having an unoccupant load factor based upon each 22 inches, one person for every three square foot. And you can see that it talks about the benefits in the first column under the tabs number one. It talks about 22 inches of stair width for each 14 people plus one person for each three square foot of hall. Unless it's sprinklered, and then you get 33% more. So you can see under tab one that there's a couple of key code concepts here in 1915 that are 105 years old today that we still talk about. First of all, you get significant benefits of fire sprinklers, recognition for capacity, and then also the 22 inches uh, you may recognize 2 times 22 is 44, and that's the standard stair width that we've had for 50-plus years. And the 22 inches is roughly the dimension of uh, the shoulder width of a male adult for a large population. To go over the tab number 2, you can see that exit requirements are a function of the occupancy of the building and not the area. So, again, there's that concept again that it's based upon the function of the occupancy. And then another uh, cool concept is number three, exit calculation should be based solely upon the number of occupants. So they're really establishing in 1915, you can see the core requirements of today's modern codes were established way back in 1915. And just for fun, I wanna point out um, number four in red there real quick. Even back at this time frame, two means of egress should be required from every floor of every building. So even the single exit concept by 1915 was not considered to be acceptable. And this is fundamental philosophy of all the codes and that we still have today is two means of egress. But, of course, back then we had some competing codes. We had UBC. What was UBC doing? UBC was coming up with a totally different approach. Group F is actually a B business today. Group F back then was an office environment. But UBC was using um, the area concept, basic building area, to figure out the number of stairways. First column in yellow is the number of stairways. The middle column in yellow, Group F, is the square footage. So you can see even at 1927, we have a different code philosophy. We also have another group called NFDA, which you're familiar with on the Life Safety Code today. National Fire Protection Association, their early um, titles were called Safety to Life, Committee to Safety to Life. And they developed a formula, and the formula is not important. What's important is look at the concepts that came into being in the formula. Um, you look at the number of persons on each floor, the number of Egress item um, A is the egress width, which is basically how wide is the stair. Item B is the construction type, whether it's fire resistive, wood, or so forth. Item C, Charlie, is the vertical openings, 
D. David against fire sprinklers, the benefits of fire sprinklers. Uh, e. Edward, if you exited horizontally straight out the door or to an adjacent building. F is the hazard level, whether it's a low, moderate hazard. So you kind of recognize that in, in today's code where we have higher hazard levels. And lastly, the number of stories. What you see there with this formula, even though the formula is kind of weak, is the key code concepts that we have in Chapter 10 of the Building Code on all of these numbers and, and figures are all being identified in this one formula by NFPA. Pretty cool concept to look at. So the predated NFPA life safety code, which we would have today, back then was called in 1934, the building exit code. And the building exit code is the first published document that we can establish that identified a one to 100 occupant load factor for office buildings. How did they come up with it? They looked at 12 buildings in Philadelphia and New York. That's a total of 12 buildings. And they counted the people going in and they counted the people going out and they subtracted the two and the remaining number of people in the building divided by the floor area. That's how they came up with the one to 100. And this is the first published um, area that we can find that identifies the one to 100 occupant load factor. So that was the simple approach that they used to establish one to 100. And another study later on in 1935, they looked at 38, excuse me, 22 buildings. And you can see the various sizes of buildings, number of stories in the table and so forth. But what's not, the numbers are not specifically important on the size, but what's important is you can see in the gross area per person, the last column, you can see even in 1935, they started realizing that the occupant load factors are varying for these offices pretty significantly. You have a low number of 66 and a high number of 151, 160. So you can see the spread is significant depending upon the size of your building and what building you're looking at the average being about 87.1. So even right there, they know that they have some issues with respect to the occupant load factor. National Bureau of Standards, which is today called NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, they also developed a, a building code um, as well. In the 1935 edition, they published the office factory workroom occupant load factor at 1 to 100. So again, we jumped up from NFPA. Here again, we get the repeated version of the occupant load factor for an office of being 1 to 100. And then in Uniform Building Code 1946, you can see that they came up with, way at the very bottom, you can see all other occupancies in the far right column, they have an occupant load factor of 1 to 100. So what you're seeing from NFPA to NBS, National Building, National Bureau of Standards, and IBC, they are all repeating the 1 to 100 occupant load factor. So it's kind of uh, basically uh, being repeated and republished in many, many different uh, standards and recommended documents. Just as a... a Interesting historical note, if you look at the rest of this table, the majority of these occupant load factors that you see in this table in 1946 from UBC are what is in Chapter 10 of IBC today. So a lot of these have remained unchanged for 70 plus years. Pretty cool. So after 46, there's a big jump to 1966. We've got a couple of studies that have occurred. And this first study is done by BOMA, building owners, and they did a whole mess of buildings. It was a volunteer survey over 6,500 buildings, 140 cities nationwide, and a billion square feet. Except for those uh, blank years, I think this study was not conducted. You can see that they were coming up with a low end for private office buildings, 
of about 150 square foot per person to a high end of about 300 plus square foot per person. Again, this is non-government sector office buildings. So they were definitely coming up with a much higher occupant load factor for an office environment. Bud Nelson, who um, is a lead uh, fire protection engineer, one of the early fire protection engineers working for the federal government, he did a survey of um, primarily, excuse me, solely federal office buildings in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., and very big studies still available to download, and he came up with 150 square foot per person as the occupant load factor based upon his study. So this, this study really is important because this is uh, one of the referenced studies that was ultimately used for the IBC adoption process for the new occupant load factor that you'll need to handle as a designer. So just as a summary of where we, um, with these various codes and standards and, and um, research reports, you can see the variation. This is both public and private for this table. Obviously, it's heavily tipped by the federal government. Almost all of these, except for one or two, are above uh, 150 occupant load factor number, and they average about 200 plus square foot per person. So you can see the variations all over the board. Um, the only one that really talks uh, about a lower number on the screen here is Canada. You can see Canada has a range 50 to 240 in their code as well. So very important. One question we want to ask before we go forward is, are we talking gross or net area? This uh, also gets um, some confusion and we get a lot of questions in this regard. So um, we want to see if you guys realize that what were the uh, original occupant load factors that I just went through in history? What were they actually talking about, a gross or net concept, and why is it gross today? In 1922, the Safety to Life, which is NFPA today, they talked about the gross uh, concept, the gross area concept, and they stated the gross area rather than a rentable area has been selected as the basis because rentable area may vary from time to time and because generally speaking, there's a fairly constant ratio between gross and rentable area. So you can see they looked at whether these occupant load factors for a business environment relate to gross or net area. And they established way back in 1922 that it was a gross area figure. And that's what you come up with today. So you can see that that is pretty much set in concrete, ain't gonna change. Um, it's based upon gross, and you can see this was coming up with the original 100 square foot back by NFPA back then. So let's talk real quick about the office trends, uh, what has happened in the office environment. The occupant load factors that I just went through in the history of the occupant load factors, what were they seeing out their window in their office environment to establish those office occupant load factors. And this is really important because this is how they came up. This is what they were viewing uh, related to occupant load factors for office. So the first one we established was Taylorism in 1904. So you can see this, um, these two pictures representing what they look like uh, back in uh, 1904. This is a typical office environment. Uh, maybe that's where they came up with the secretary pool but you have rows and rows of people and desks. Very um, interesting configuration. 1930s, we start to get a little bit more uh, space between the desks and so forth. As you can see, there's a little bit larger gaps um, and so forth in 1930s, and people are having a little bit more privacy, a greater area. Then in 1960, jumping up to 1960, German office style came up with the open office layout. You can see that they grouped design, clerical, research, and corporate headquarters people in different groups and uh, trying to de-emphasize the hierarchy and increasing group interaction and so forth. Then you talk about the cubicle uh, revolution. This is about 1960 to 1980. Now, this is probably where most people think 
the 100 square foot per person occupant load factor came up with, the 10 by 10 cube. But as you can see, this concept by Herman Miller and so forth is well, well past uh, the early, you know, 60 or 70 years past the early establishment of the 100 per person occupant load factor that we previously talked about. So today in um, 2011, GSA conducted a study and they established way before we had a lot of the, the new office layouts today, they came up with uh, different concepts of the workplace environment, teleworking, uh, hotel stations, desk sharing, the virtual office. Obviously, with today's um, COVID-19 situation, we're doing a lot of the virtual officing and so forth. But this is uh, a concept that GSA realized that it was coming back in 2011. The whole environment of the office is completely changing. Um, which is part, again, part, this study here, the 2011 and the Bud Nelson 1969 study are going to be combined and eventually used to help justify the change to the IBC. So then when we look at today, what are we talking about today? We have a totally different office environment, as you can see from these various pictures, totally different office environment in the sense of collaborative spaces, huddle spaces, um, and again, you can see from these pictures and the earlier pictures and the earlier studies that what we envision today and what we're designing and building today and renovating is totally different than what was intended originally. So there's a big, big concept difference between then and now. So let's talk about the code changes actually that occurred from this history, all the stuff that I provided to you, we're building up that story, because the designer is going to need to know this information that we just went through uh, going forward. So you'll see where that, that money shot comes in in a second here. So this study was published by um, WPI, Worcester Polytech. They created the study, a lot of this presentation material is coming from this study, where they collected the data of these occupant load factors, um, as you can see summarized in the top table. And this was the primary source document, this one study here that was submitted and the Bud Nelson information, as I pointed out in the GSA study are all embedded in this documentation. This was what was used during the code change process. Again, this started way back in 2015, it takes three years to make the code change started back in April of 2015, and this is where you propose it to a committee that uh, hears your technical discussion and is making a proposal to change the 2015. So what was the proposed change submitted to the committee back in 2015? Here's the actual code change, E9-215. That was the initial submitted documentation excuse me, code change with supporting documentation, which is the study on the previous slide. And you can see that they struck out the 100 and inserted a 150. They haven't touched the word gross, so it's simply going from 100 to 150. But more importantly, they added an entirely new um, function of space related to business called concentrated business use areas. And that's a subset of the business use concept and they reference section 1004.6. All right, so here's the actual um, section 1004.6. This was what was submitted again back in 2015, and you can see uh, the various texts, and they're talking about concentrated business use areas. And they're basically talking, as you can read the first or the second line, call centers, trading floors, and so forth, but they're basically talking about areas with a higher density of occupants. That's the key to what they're talking about, is areas with a higher density of occupants. And what they mean here is um, they're talking about primarily the uh, density related to um, the occupant load factor, remember we already changed it to 150, so now they're talking about uh, higher density than 
150. And if you look at the very last uh, sentence, you notice there's a reference of, but not less than one per 100. But not less than one per 100 is the very last sentence of this proposed change. So as initially submitted, we're changing. Why are we changing? They simply are stating that based upon studies, They've come up with the change from 100 to 150, and then they talked about this higher density of occupancies that would normally be being normally would be expected in an office environment, and that's what they're calling the concentrated business use areas. So we're definitely talking about two different concepts, and this is the actual reason from what they published. Oops, let's see here. There we go. There we go. All right, so what was the proposed change? Proposed change initially submitted was a 50 to 100 range. If you actually read the very pack on the bottom paragraph in the box there, the proposal was initially to be a range of 50 to 100. They did not actually have it um, established as the 50 at this point. They actually proposed a range of 50 to 100. And I think this was more related to people keeping the original 100 occupant load factor that's been in play for 100 years. But this is what actually showed up in the code book. What's actually in the code book? I showed you a lot of the background information, but this is what was actually published. And it is in year 2018. So this is again on the new uh, language for the concentrated business use, and it's specifically talking about uh, call centers, trading floors, electronic data centers, and similar business use areas. And and similar business use areas is really going to be open to interpretation. So anything other than an average typical office environment is probably going to fall into this similar business use area which is where the owner or the designer is really going to have to justify and describe what this is all about. And you notice, remember I showed you in the previous slides, a range of 50 to 100. This was actually what was accepted was not less than 50. Okay, and maybe people who are involved in WeWork or spaces recognize that number. That's a design goal of the more concentrated office environment, but that's what we're talking about today is uh, not less than one occupant per 50 square feet. Please note that anything other than 150 square foot per person, anything other than a 150 square foot per person, you have to get approval by the building official to go less than or more dense than 150 square foot per person. So, and this is what the justification was for that change from 100 to, to 50. The modification from 100 per occupant to 50 square, 50 square foot per person as the maximum concentrated business use is appropriate. The documentation shows, okay, so that, that the word the documentation shows is all the historical stuff that I just went through in all those early slides and the reports and the research and the code books, that the worst case scenario of 50 square per person occurs in these highly density, density spaces. So that's why it supports this change. So that's the key. The only place that in all that documentation that we could find as a reference to the 50, uh, having gone through all that stuff and showed you really quickly, the only place we can find a reference is this one location in Canada in their standards. We could not find any other reference to a 50 square foot per person concept. Pretty interesting. What does the IBC commentary have? This is where, this is the big issue where it's gonna impact designers and owners and, and, and renovation projects and so forth. The IBC commentary specifically says, and this is under the, um, business occupancy, and this is talking about the concentrated business occupant factor, it says it's the designer's responsibility should provide information to the code official 
based upon the actual oxygen load anticipated for such use. So basically, as part of getting the code official's approval, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the designer, this is in the commentary, is responsible for getting this information to the code official. So the designer is going to have to justify, analyze, and prepare this documentation to the code official. And that's why the historical stuff we just went through is really important. Okay, so how do we do that? All right, so let's talk about where does this concentrated occupant load apply? This is right out of the code book. It says it applies to call centers, applies to trading floors, and electronic processing data centers. So you can see some of the terminology that they're using is not matching up to what actual it is in the industry and what we're actually building out in the field. But that's the current terminology right there. And remember, it says, and similar places. So what do we mean by similar places? The code says, and similar places. So what does it mean by similar places? Does it mean these collaborative spaces, these Starbucks-like uh, coffee bars that we have in office spaces, the testing center? We have lots of different design changes that have occurred in these office environments. Is that what they mean by similar business use areas? So just want to give you some a little helpful guidance on how to uh, write your rationale and justification to the code official. First of all, remind you that a business is a, uh, an occupant used for transaction of business other than mercantile. But the key here is the characteristics of the people in a business environment. They're primarily adults. They're familiar with the surrounding. And they're generally focused, not distracted, and they're very self-sufficient. That's the general 10,000-foot level of business. Uh, in the assembly environment, maybe a collaborative space huddle, you have a totally different concept under assembly. And assembly could be any age group. They're not necessarily self-sufficient. Could be distracted by other activities like drinking, eating, a show, or so forth and may or may not have been familiar with that surroundings. So just remember the key concepts of what a business is versus an assembly. So when you try to describe this to the code factor. So let's just talk about the um, impact on, this is a 10,000 foot look at what's the impact. And then we'll get into the examples to finish this up. Here's the 10,000 view look of changing the occupant load factor from 10, uh, 100 square foot to 150. Obviously, it reduces the number of occupants. But what does that mean? We're reducing the number of required exits for exit access. That's a possible reduction. We are definitely reducing, because of the lower number of occupants, the required egress width. When the number of people go down, the plumbing fixtures potentially go down as well. Uh, ventilation, mechanical, MEP kind of related stuff is not impacted. So what happens when we go to the concentrated business use? What happens when we go from the old 100 to the new 50 square foot per person? Clearly, we're increasing the octant load. This is potentially increasing the number of exits, exit access. We're also potentially increasing uh, the egress width because the, you can see just from the density calculation, you're doubling the number of people here and therefore you're increasing the plumbing fixture counts as well. So those are the 10,000 you look at that. So let's talk about the actual examples. So we've got a few minutes here, we'll go through three examples. The first example is a build to suit, which basically means that we're designing this for a specific owner occupied space. Uh, and we're comparing the ramifications of this project by changing the octet load factor from 100 to 150. So nothing, uh, you don't need to look at the details, but basically we calculate, um, if you take a look at the table, you have two columns um, on the far right. If we use the 100 uh, occupant load factor from the 2015 code in the far right column, you'll see that we come up with 635 people calculated occupant load for that yellow area of the building. In the blue column, which is the second column over uh, from the right, you use the new occupant load factor 150. Once you use the 150 calculation, 
in the 2018 IBC, you can see that the octoload factor results in a reduction in calculation of population down to 424. So what did that calculation do when we compare those two numbers? First of all, we reduced the total overall octet load density of the people. So in theory, we're going to have more distance between people, increased social distancing, I guess would be the buzzword today. But if you actually look at the table, we're actually reducing the number of code required exits. Because as you may recall, 500 is the threshold. Once you get above 500, you need three exits. So with the new occupant load, we are now down to only requiring two exits. And also, the plumbing fixture counts drop down significantly as well because you're redoing the calcs. The last example I'll show you with the detailed plumbing calcs, I'll show you that. Um, but the plumbing counts will be reduced because you're now at 424 instead of 635. And well, there is one potential if, uh, if it's a non sprinkler building, you could potentially eliminate the fire, manual fire alarm system, um, not required for a business environment if it's less than 500, assuming the building's not sprinkled. So that, that's a major impact, as you can see, on the design layout of an office environment. So what about the next example, which is probably uh, the one that has potential greatest impact? And um, this scenario is a tenant finish out of an existing high rise building. So basically the core and shell of this building is already fixed in place and we're coming in and we're building out this tenant space. So we did an egress analysis. <clears throat> First, as you know, with a tenant finish out, you have to figure out what the egress of the core exits can handle. So first you do that analysis <clears throat> and you realize that the exits can handle 452 people. So we have two exits, a vacant floor. So that's the first thing that your analysis will be doing. Okay, and um, this is based upon, that has nothing to do with occupant load. This is just straight occupant load uh, calculations out of chapter 10. This is not talking about density of people yet. This is just using the factors in the building code that had not changed between 2015 and 2018. And you can see from this table, when we do the same analysis, go to the right two columns. If we did this project under 2015, we come up with 487 people. And if we did this project under the 2018 in blue, we come up with 382 people. Remember from that black sentence right under the table, the existing exits are designed for 452 people. So under the 2018 IBC, we actually have 105 people less under the 150 square foot occupant load factor, which is pretty cool, meaning you have ability to go back, you have spare capacity under the 2018. However, under the 2015, you are actually exceeding the available exit capacity, which is 452, and you're coming up with 487. So you would have to do some other analysis and justification to uh, work out the 487 versus the 452, such as a horizontal exit or something to that regard. But you can see there's a big difference here. There's a big impact as a result of using the different codes. And a lot of times, just to remind you, exit one and two for the core building, especially if the core building was designed under, say, the previous code, the 2015, the core base building architect assumes a certain occupant load for that vacant floor. So they may have assumed one to 100. And you come in faster and build out that space under the 2018, and that's a different occupant load factor. So there's a big impact with this analysis when you go through this analysis. The 105 is the extra. We've already covered most of this already here. Uh, again, it reduces the plumbing fixture count. You have the potential to add more offices in this environment as well because you had 105 spare people. All right, last example here, just finishing up. 
is a concentrated business use. What's the implication of now going from the 100 to the 50 in the same project example? And just for uh, simple purposes, we're using a data center. And I'm not necessarily saying a data center in 2015 was automatically 1 to 100, but just for example of this presentation. And if you look at the orange arrow, you can see under the 2018 in the blue column that our occupant load for a data center doubles with the 50 square foot concentrated occupant load factor being used. Very significant increase as a result of that. And you can see the ramifications of this increase. It is pretty significant. Uh, we're 63% higher in occupants loading. Um, a large number of people here. You can see in the middle part of the presentation, you can see we're going to end up, because of that, we're going to have to have another exit added to the building. We're doubling the egress width easily because of the data center. And if you do the middle of the uh, slide, you can see that that's a fixture count analysis. You can see the water closets and lavatories that you can compare. You can see that we're basically doing a significant many more uh, fixtures as a result. And you can see in the bottom there the required number of exits and the egress capacity. So much, much more impact as a result of using this concentrated business use occupant load factor. So those three examples are um, should show you the imp implications. Remember um, that it's the designer to, uh, is responsible to either A, use the 150 or anything other than 150, the designer needs to come up with and submit to the code official the use of the occupant load factor, the new 50 uh, square foot occupant load factor if you're going below 150. So this table here summarizes, uh, before we open this up to questions here, this table summarizes the previous um, occupant load factor of 100 gross under the 2015 IBC and all the way back to the early turn of the century, 100 years. And then under the red text, you can see in 2018, we have 150 gross for an average typical office environment. And then anything that's other than or similar use to a data center or a concentrated they came up with a new occupant load factor in, in section 1004.8, which is the 50, or another number that needs to be justified through the designer. So at this point, I want to uh, turn it back over to um, Liz for see if we have any questions. Thank you, Warren. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and hit submit. And if we don't have time to get to your question during the call today, Warren will follow up with you afterwards. All right, let's take our first question. My jurisdiction does not adopt, has not adopted the 2018 IBC yet. Can I get the local authorities to accept the new criteria for my project? Yes, I think that's a, that's a good question, Liz. Uh, I think that you would want to analyze the 2015 versus the 2018 and see if there is a benefit to going to the 2018, but just assuming that it's a, you're going from 100 to 150, there would be a benefit. Um, but you would have to put the rationale together and justification because it would be considered an alternate method. Um, and obviously, WJE can do that and help you with that. But uh, yes, you can do that. Okay, our next question. Why do we need to justify a more dense load factor to the AHJ as long as we have the required exit width? That's a good question there. Um, we do have to, anything other than 150, as you recall in that slide, anything other than 150 square foot per person, the code, the very next sentence says you have to get the permission of the code official and you have to provide justification you have to do some kind of analysis, documentation of the potential use and occupancy and layout, and you have to submit it to the code official for their review and approval. It's it's not automatic. That's the key to that that paragraph. It's not automatic. You don't have um, a table and chart. You're just applying the 50. You have to ask permission to apply the 50 or some other number. 
So you do have to ask permission. Okay, our next question. Who determines when a, quote, more concentrated use space exists in a building, the architect or the AHJ? Well, I actually, I would, I would start uh, that question with uh, starting with the owner, the, the tenant, the occupant load first. And we would normally call that part of the programming, get that information from the owner, the occupant of the space, the architect collects that information. And then that's the, the documentation that I mentioned that the designer, as you can see, it's right in the commentary. Um, the ICC is dumping it on the designer as the responsibility. Obviously, we can help you do that, but they need to pull that together and put that together in a formal submission to the code official as proof and so forth. So that, that to me, is ultimately the designer's responsibility in conjunction with a code consultant or so forth. Okay, our next question. How would you calculate OLF in a huddle slash flex room area with lounge seating? I would first start with, um, this is where I mentioned to you earlier, slide talks about business versus assembly. What we are finding is, is that um, many code officials are treating those spaces, even though those spaces are in an office environment and those people are in an office environment, many code officials are treating that as an assembly space. And it goes back to the function of the space. Remember in the very beginning, I told you what's the function of the space. The function of the space is uh, people sitting closer than 150. That could be classified as an assembly use because the goal of that space is to get people closer and have a little bit greater interaction between, and that's getting closer to uh, an assembly definition as opposed to a business. With this new concentrated, you may be able to use the argument that the concentrated occupant load factor is the more appropriate. Instead of the 1 to 15 for assembly, you use the 1 to 50 and call that a concentrated space. So that, that may be the better approach there as opposed to the assembly. You don't want it to be assembly space. Okay, our next question. Is there a justification for the code using different factors for conference rooms, um, like 15 square feet per occupancy, classrooms 20 square feet per occupancy, and potentially concentrated business use areas like 50 square feet per occupancy? Yes, not part of this presentation. More than glad to answer you offline, um, but there is um, historical not discrepancies, but differences between the 7 and the 15. I can help you offline on that one. Okay, next question. As a base building architect for a new office building, we don't know what the tenant type will be, but we need to design the egress and cores. What factors should be used? Excellent question. Uh, core and shell architect design. We typically recommend, well, at a minimum, whatever decision you choose, in conjunction with your owner developer, uh, no matter what you do, we recommend that you document it on your egress plans and say the base building architect has based this future layout on the following occupant load factor or, or so forth. And just make sure you put that on your drawings, on your egress calcs. That's number one. Um, but there's different models that we've used, approaches. One is we might use a ratio like an 80-20 concept where it's 80% offices at 1 to 150 and 20% highly concentrated. Or we might do a split of uh, 70, 20, and 10, including some uh, conference rooms in their assembly as well. So that concept, there's many different ones. There's not one that's uh, published as a single way to do it, um, but the key where we see the biggest problem when we review drawings for architects to see if they're compliant, the biggest problem we see is the basis of design, i.e., which you just asked the questions for sizing exits, is not documented, not supported uh, in your in your submittal. Drawings live forever. Emails and, and letter agreements between code officials don't seem to last as well as drawings do. Okay, our next question. 
Why would an electronic data processing center be considered a concentrated business occupancy? Good question. I think uh, do you probably frustrations. Uh, some of our clients have really questioned that. That's the that electronic data processing center is the exact term um, that many of our clients nationally and internationally use in what they call their data centers, um, and they're very frustrated that the term used in the code book matches theirs. But obviously, in their book, in their data centers, they only have two or three maintenance people on these facilities, nowhere near, and they're constantly battling, and we've helped them justify why ICC chose that term. I, I do not know. I can do a little bit more research on that, but uh, that is a problem that they're lumping all data centers into that one category, and it's very misleading. I don't disagree. It's an excellent question. Okay, our next question. What kind of responses to analysis submitted to code officials are you hearing about? Are code officials receptive? Yes. Um, so the, the type of analysis is, again, it's you and I would call it probably the programming document stuff that you and I would have done during the programming phase and concept phase. That analysis, uh, a lot of times obviously, is not submitted to the code officials. But that kind of analysis that architects and designers do normally for clients, that's the kind of stuff that uh, we've been using and working with our clients to pull together and submitting to code officials. And what we typically do is take that analysis and then we put a document on top of that from us that goes into the details of the code component of it where the architect is providing all of the actual proposed concept for the owner. And we pull all that together and we submit that as a single package, which has been pretty successful. We did several projects uh, here in Texas this way, and it has been accepted using that approach. Okay, next question. I thought gross occupant load included toilet rooms, corridors, etc., other than open shafts, correct? No, actually that question um, is coming from the old UBC. UBC, Uniform Building Code, had exactly what you just said in that code book where it actually excluded bathrooms and so forth. In IBC, when the first IBC came out in 2000, those type of subtractions are not permitted. Technically, in IBC, um, all potential areas of occupancy, including stairs, elevators, everything, is required to be included in the calculation for the area of the building as part of the egress calculation. So there's no permission to delete bathrooms and so forth. Okay, lots of good questions coming in. We've got time for one more. The last question that we'll answer uh, live on the call today is, What uh, was it determined that the 150 square foot per occupancy more accurately reflects the occupant load factor of cubicle style offices spaces? So not specifically. Um, you're asking about the cubicle, and then again, that was the 1980s time frame of the cubicle, the Herman Miller concept. Uh, no, not necessarily. You can see a lot of the studies and a lot of the data was predating the cubicle concept and didn't even address the cubicle concept. So no, it's not directly tied to the cubicle concept. No, sir. Okay. As I said, that is all the time that we have for questions today. If Warren didn't get a chance to answer your question live on the call, he will follow up with you afterwards. We'd like to thank you for joining us, and we hope it's been educational. In a couple hours, you should receive an email uh, with a link to an on-demand version of this webinar that you can use to rewatch the presentation at your convenience or share with any colleagues who weren't able to join us live today. And that email will also include a link to download your certificate of participation. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Warren. Uh, his information is on your screen. Uh, or if you have any questions about the webinar itself or the recording, don't hesitate to reach out to me, Liz Pimper at lpimper at wje.com. Thank you so much again for your time, and we hope you have a great rest of the day.